redeems sorrow and turns it to strength. Have you experienced that in your life? He takes a sorrow and makes strength out of it. You know, one day we know, Revelation 21, 4, that he'll redeem it completely. Remember, he said he'll wipe away every tear from her eyes and every reason for tears. But what about now? How, he, how does he change us and help us now? Well, he does. We all know Romans 8, 28. We know that God causes all things to work together for our good to those who love God. It's important as we continue to love him, he will change these things. He redeems sorrow to strength. That's why the illustration of the Lord's Supper is a total picture of that. That's why we read Isaiah 53. Because of that wonderful picture of taking sorrow and suffering and redeeming it to strength. So I'd like to read this morning it's Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews 5, 7 through 11. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. Now he was heard, I'll complete it, sorry it isn't complete on the PowerPoint, but I'll complete it. But he was heard because of his godly fear, and he learned to be perfect, and he learned obedience to the things that he suffered. How could Jesus learn obedience? Through the things he suffered. So there was a purpose in the suffering, a greater good. As we saw Jesus in our text today, he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He was crushed. But yet Isaiah says very clearly, even though he was crushed, he would receive eternal glory and be lifted up. So what is this about today, Isaiah 53? He turned sorrow into strength, according to the Bible. This beautiful passage in Hebrew shows that he suffered for purpose to strengthen him and make him better. You know, in our toughest times in life, God uses it to strengthen us. You know, every, any, every physiologist tells us that when you lift weights, is it fun lifting weights, everybody? Yes. You're not to do it every day, but you should do it every other day because your muscles hurt. If you do it right, that they hurt after you do them, right? When you exercise, there's pain in the muscle. Why? Because it's growing the muscle. Isn't there another way? That's what I ask. No. Through that pain, you're blessing. Now, you know, we have joy in life, but there's also a pain. God never told us in this fallen world everything would be good and great. God's working all things together for our good, though. You know, there was an amazing grandmother. And why is it, if you notice how grandmothers have the most wisdom, right, grandmas? Yeah. yeah. They have the most wisdom, and, and I've been a blessed to be uh, here, the wisdom of grandmas. And uh, one of them was this. She said, boy, we are living in hurting times, but God is still good and he's still working. That's what a grandma said. Another grandma said this, even the pastors. He said, even pastors experience good and bad, even in church, but never give up because God is working. Do you need that word? Amen. Is God working in every circumstances? Yeah. Why does a grandma seem to say the right thing? Wait a minute. I thought God's was to take away all suffering and sorrow and grief. Well, we don't live in that kind of world, but God's working, right? God's working? Amen. You know, God is superintending our life. If we love him, he's superintending our life. I love what Jacob said in the Old Testament. He said that God has been a shepherd every single moment of my life. He shepherded me. God has. God sees every pain. He collects every tear. He measures every kind of suffering in our life. Jesus went through sufferings. Jesus went through sorrow. Remember how he was sorrowful at the tomb of Lazarus? Death was not God's purpose. It was not, and he wept. Luke 19, Jesus wept over Jerusalem, their unbelief. Boy, does God weep over the unbelief of this world today, too. Tears are a means of healing, though. I think that's important for us to know that yeah, there's a means of healing, and it's called tears. Tears also um, help. Did you know that? When your heart's aching, it's actually a means of healing, like I said. You seek God, and, you, and, you, and tears help heal the hurt and the sorrow. I, uh, all of us were touched a few years ago by Eric Clapton's song, 
no tears in heaven. Do you remember that song? It was a sad song because his son, I think, what his son died tragically and just unexpectedly, and he wrote the beautiful song, No Tears in Heaven. What a beautiful song. When I think about tears, one thing causes me to tear up is the fact that elephants have tears. Did you know that? Elephants grieve. You know, dogs, when they grieve, it's kind of a whine, right? But elephants, actually, they've documented them. Elephants cry when they're in grief. Elephants are amazing. There was a uh, scene that I saw on National Geographic of a mother elephant that her baby died and she stood over it for seven days grieving and didn't eat for seven days. Incredible. If you know anything about elephants, the way God made them, they have incredible memory. Unbelievable depth of feeling and unbelievable bonding. I mean, the more you study about them, the more you're amazed at it. But elephants have deep feelings. That's why when you talk about circuses, they, they better treat the animals rightly, if at all, right? right? And many times in circuses, they go to go berserk. And I wonder if we studied it, what that was all about. But what's my point? My point is even creation cries and has sorrow that was put on it by us, not... But in the Old Testament, there's an amazing scripture. I'd like to read this to you. And this illustrates the truth of God turns sorrow into strength if we love him. In Genesis 35, it says that they were when they moved from Bethel, that's Jacob and uh, Rachel. Jacob and Rachel, remember the Old Testament? Abraham, <laughs> Isaac, and Jacob. When they moved to Bethel, while they were still some distance from Ephrath, Ephrath is Bethlehem. Remember Ephrata, Bethlehem, Ephrata? That's Bethlehem. Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, don't despair for you have another son. Do you know who that other son was of Rachel? Benjamin. Joseph. Boy. Don't despair, you have another son. And she breathed her last for she was dying and she named her son Benoni. But his father named him Benjamin. And there we go, the truth of scripture. She said, name him Ben-Oni. Ben is son, and Oni is, guess what it is? Do you have any idea? Well, the midwife came in and said, don't be in despair, or don't name him this, you know. Uh, you have another son, you know, you still have the blessing. Well, she came in and named him Benoni. But the father, Jacob, said, no, Benjamin. You know, when we think about pain and suffering, we think about the fact you know, when we think of our pain and suffering, think about the pain and suffering and sorrow of God. Think about it just for a minute. The fact that his creation betrayed him, his kids, Adam and Eve, and the planet. His great highest angel he made rebelled and took a third of the angels in rebellion. Think about the fact that God had to recreate the earth because it got so wicked before Noah. Genesis gives us the details of the wickedness of humankind. Then think about the Tower of Babel. They didn't learn a thing after the ark. After 200 years, Babel was about 200 years after the, they came off the ark. 200 years later, they're building the Tower of Babel to rebel against God. Think about the book of Acts. It says all the nations chose to go their own way and stray from God. Think about the fact that Jesus actually wept in sorrow because the text implies it when John the Baptist was murdered by Herod. They say, this is the saying of Jerusalem. They said, Jerusalem is a city of a thousand tears. Well, I say that's incorrect. Jerusalem is a city of a billion tears, the tears of God. You know, it's, a, it's amazing about names, Benoni and Benjamin. Which do you like, Benoni or Benjamin? Uh, names are kind of interesting. Remember in Ruth, the two names, Chilean, and Malon and Chilion, remember those names? you know what they stand for? Anybody know? What did Naomi name her children in grief? She was in sorrow. So why not name your children in sorrow, right? How do you like the name Puny and Whiny? Do you like those names? 
Come here, puny. Puny, come here. No, puny. Whiny, stop it, whiny. Good job, whiny, whiny. Come here, whiny. Wow, okay. What about the song by the man in black? Excuse me, excuse me, anyway, not me. The man in black. <laughs> Johnny Cash, remember the boy named Sue? Remember that one? A name can really ruin you, I tell you. I remember in Burbank Hospital, I remember going in to uh, visit a family. <laughs> And uh, at 27, I visited these families in the hospital. One of them was having a boy named Clem. And it was so crazy, I didn't tell the family. All I could think about was Clem Kadiddlehopper, okay? Anybody old enough to remember who Clem Kadiddlehopper is? When I was a little kid, I loved Red Skelton. My, my, my brother loved the combat movie, and I loved Red Skelton. They would always fight over which was going to be seen. And then, when I was a verb in a hospital, I don't know why, what happened to our congregation there. Actually, the, the birth of a girl, and her name, they named her Susie Q, okay? And I go, wow. Well, remember, be careful how you name your children. Uh, especially, you know, uh, my name. I don't know if you know my name, but you know what my birth name is, and I've never gone by it. But you know what my birth name is, anybody know? It's Woody. Do I look like a Woody? Where's your The word is an Elwood. The word is Elwood Stewart Drake. <laughs> so never went by it, never knew it, and always went by Stewart from birth. But anyway, uh, be careful how you name your children. So Rachel said, Benoni, son of my sorrow, I am going to name him after this horrible event that I'm going through right now. Now the Hebrew word for Benoni is, again, sorrow. But do you realize Hebrew is strange like some other languages do? Hebrew means son of my sorrow or son of my misfortune, but it means, but sorrow can also mean strength. So I really looked at that. Sorrow in the Hebrew can also mean strength. So which did she choose? Well, obviously it's she chose sorrow. But are strength and sorrow opposites or are they connected? Everybody with me? Are they opposites? Are they connected? According to the Hebrews, they're connected. You know, great strength is born out of great sorrow. What if great strength is given only through sorrow? What if that's God working that he tells us he works in all circumstances? You know, the greatest proof that you've endured I think some of the greatest people I know of are those people that have endured great sorrow and great pain. Could, you know, do you realize the Bible tells us very clearly and succinctly that out of pain, much is done? Let's see it in, in Jesus the great high priest in Hebrews chapter 4. Jesus the great high priest. Therefore, since we have such we have a, high, uh, a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, that is Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. Okay, he's been through sorrow. This is what makes him strong. We do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize with our, uh, empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Meaning what? We have a God who's gone through it. He knows all about it. He conquered it. And he can help those that go through it. But let's get more specific about what the Bible says about sorrow. Glory in our sorrow and suffering, how could it be? Well, let's look at Romans chapter 5, 3 through 4. Not only, so, not only so, Paul said, but we also glory in our suffering. Wait a minute, did anybody hear sorrowful, suffering, and you're going around glorifying? You're going around praising and happy and hallelujah. Anybody that's hallelujah in sorrow and suffering? Well, this is what it says. For we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character produces 
And the word hope is an unfadable hope in the Lord. So there it goes. Wow. So sorrow and strength are interrelated together beautifully. You know, I, I think about the fact that Jesus suffered. I mean, he, Jesus suffered from the beginning of time. His time, excuse me, his time on earth, right? How did Jesus begin by his suffering? He began by suffering. He was born in a manger. Think about in the Bible all the suffering that turned into strength. Think about another one that comes more home. Even though we know the Bible is true and we can understand the Bible, we know that Noah, what kind of strong man was he for what God did through him? What about Abraham is told to go, just go to a place I'll name, and you just go. Could I know the name, Lord? No, I'm not going to tell you the name. Okay, I'll go. What kind of strength did that suffering to leave his home? Moses suffering 40 years with a cantankerous, slanderous, horrible people of Israel. 40 years with these people that kept complaining against Moses and complaining against God and complaining and rioting and coming against each other. Oh, how could Moses put up with that? It made for a very strong, strong believer. Job, what about Job? When he suffered. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It went and worshipped. I really have a hard time, even though I know I should, and I can, and I will, but I have a really hard time after sorrow, and suffering, and slander, and everything comes against you. I have a hard time going to God immediately and saying, praise you, Lord, amazing grace. <laughs> that was sweet. I've got a little hard time with that. But according to what God says, he'll strengthen us for that. Think about Daniel. What kind of suffering did he have? He lived 98 years, they estimate, in Babylon with idolatry and immorality. And it strengthened him, that suffering. What about Samson? Oh, how, my father-in-law and I used to debate, Lane's dad and I used to debate, how did Samson make it into the hall of faith? He was a backslider. Well, guess what? His suffering in the mill, his eyes gouged out, his great suffering caused great faith to rise in Samson, reclaiming the faith that he had. This is just amazing. Hebrews 11 says, many of the Old Testament people triumphed, and many suffered, and they gained a better resurrection. Think about Joseph, the suffering of Joseph, that made him able to be the strongest leader ever, probably in history. Jeremiah suffered. He was left behind. He, didn't, he wasn't sent off to Babylon. He was left behind with all the destruction of Jerusalem, and he had to endure that. That's why he wrote Lamentations. <laughs> Don't ever read Lamentations when you're depressed. Okay, you promise? Okay. Right. Oh, but what a strong and great prophet Jeremiah was, Ezekiel. And what about Hosea? Come on. Okay, you're going to understand me a little bit better what I'm feeling, the Lord said to Hosea. I want you to go marry a prostitute, and she'll continue to be a prostitute, but you're to marry her and be faithful to her. Wait a minute, a prostitute? Yes. And this is a sign of how Israel's treating me, says the Lord. Okay. Hosea is one of the greatest prophets, but to prove the point, is it true that great suffering, great sorrow can be turned into strength? Absolutely. Who is the strongest generation you know of in this America that we live? Maybe you'd say 1776 generation, yes. But who recently is the strongest generation that you know of? Well, let me tell you. Those that suffered the Depression in the 30s, and World War II in the 40s, they produced the strongest, most amazing people in America, correct? How is this formed? By joy and grace and beauty? By much suffering, which many of us can't imagine. Can you imagine going through the 30s and then the 40s? But it produced a strong generation. What about Jesus? Before he entered into ministry, he suffered for 40 days, fasting. And then after 40 days, he faced the devil. Why? Because that was what strengthened him for the ministry and mission that God called him to do. 
He had to go through the suffering first of the 40 days. And then face the devil in weakness. Think about the suffering of Paul. I think about that. It's unbelievable. Paul's suffering and sorrow. And yet what a strong man he was. A joyous man. You know, Acts 15 says, I'll read it. Paul was stoned at Lystra for preaching the gospel. The List Lystra people drug, drug his body outside the city and dumped him on rocks. And his disciples came and stood around Paul. And Paul arose. <laughs> Don't you love that? God supernaturally healed him. Uh, the scene is that he drug his body outside the city. There's no more <laughs> preaching now for that man. Then he just stood up and rose and went on. Peter, his denial, his suffering and denial, he learned a lot. Because he'd never do it again. Even under the toughest of circumstances, never again. I learned through this sorrow and suffering. Peter was beaten, put in prison, harassed. Became bold as a light. I love what the Lord Jesus said about Paul to Ananias. Acts chapter 9, verse 15. Paul is my chosen instrument to bear my name before the Gentiles, the kings, and of Israel. I will show him how much he is to suffer for my name's sake. I will show Paul how much he is to suffer for my name's sake. Did that destroy Paul? Or did it strengthen Paul? Which? Which? John was boiled in oil and survived by God's miracle. John the Baptist was persecuted beyond. And you know, sorrow sometimes is God's plan to help us not hurt us. Sometimes we must suffer to make us better. But only when it's in God and not in sin or evil. No, God does not ordain sin suffering or evil suffering. Think about David suffered. David suffered both the sorrow of his sin and David suffered the sorrow of evil people. He suffered both. What did it produce in David? A weak Christian? A weak believer? One of the strongest. He learned from the suffering of his sin. Boy, not again. Then the suffering of people, he learned how to trust God and deepen his relationship with the Lord. It, when you read the Psalms, does not he have a deep, deep, deep relationship with the Lord that came through suffering? I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, the strongest people I know are those that have suffered greatly. A.W. Tozer said, God cannot use a man or woman till they be broken. God can't use a man or woman until they be broken. Why? We need to break our pride. We need to be humble, right? Amen. We need to be teachable. Are you teachable? Or do you know it all? I don't. Scriptures know it all. God knows it all. You know, Dr. Phil said this so powerfully. He said 2020 and 2021 was a season of suffering. And he said the sad thing is it wasn't just physical. It was mental, emotional, and spiritual. And he said, this is Dr. Phil. Did we learn to trust God or man during this time? He spelled out in a beautiful document the full parameters of suffering. So we've had that season. So during this time, have we been strengthened or we increased in fear? Have we gotten closer to God and more firm in God, or have we responded? You know, your tears today will water the crop of God's love for you tomorrow. Let me repeat that. Your tears today will water the crop of God's love to you for tomorrow, for it will bear fruit. Does God waste a tear or a pain? No, he redeems it. Does God waste his suffering? No, he redeems it. If it's suffering because of our stupidity or our sin, God will forgive us and God will change us and God will produce another plan. Well, you ever know, you know what Benoni means, what? 
child of my son of my sorrow. Ben is again son. Oni is sorrow. Why did Jacob enforce and want so desperately his son to be called Benjamin? We will take it up next week. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, <laughs> Do you want to know what Benjamin means? Anybody? Well, I'll take it up next week. No. <laughs> Let me read another couple of scriptures. I'll bait you. Look how Mary suffered. How Joseph suffered. Both of them. This is Christmas is another month. Can you believe that? They suffered so much. Look what Simeon said in the temple. Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. And a sword will pierce your heart because of this child. You're going to be shattered. Obviously that was the prophecy of the cross. It's going to shatter you, but you will recover and you will be strengthened. You know, God is amazing. Even Though we cause the fall and we cause the curse, he chose to work through it and in it, and I'm thankful for it. When I think of what the Lord did in this simple passage, you know, the Bible is like you can squeeze as much out of the Bible, and it'll speak in new heights and new depths to you if you just open it. So, what is Benjamin's name. Why did Jacob, with his dying wife that he loved, well, remember he loved his wife, Rachel? How, how long did he serve for Rachel? Has anybody here served 14 years for your spouse in order to marry him? You had to serve 14 years before you could marry your spouse. How many have done that? Nobody. He served 14 years Laban. Because Laban tricked him. Remember, the trickster got tricked. Do you think that was God's intention? Jacob's name is the trickster, the deceiver. He ran into Laban, who tricked him. And he really wanted to marry Rachel, and he tricked him into serving him. Not a slave, but serving him for 14 years. The Bible says over and over how he loved him, Jacob. I mean, how Jacob loved Rachel. And do you remember the encounter with Jacob that changed him? He was kind of a half-believer, a backslidden believer all his life. And do you remember before when he had to face Esau, he had to face his sins, he had to face his sinful actions toward his brother? Remember what happened? Remember Jacob went in and pretended to be Esau? Esau was the firstborn, the firstborn gets a blessing, so he went in and faked and wore even a hairy, you know, his brother was hairy, he wasn't, so he put a hairy thing on. He said he threw the smell of the wild upon himself. His mother was part of the deception on Isaac. And he went in and he said, I am your son Isaac. And I love what, I mean, I am your son Esau. And Isaac said, you don't sound like my son. Oh, I am your son. And the wife said, Oh, he, he is, and then he is. And then he was couldn't see very well. Remember, he put he was putting his left hand up, and Isaac, I mean Jacob grabbed his right hand, put it on him. Yeah, the right hand was the the hand of blessing, the hand of honor, the hand of glory. So he wanted the right hand put on him. So he grabbed his hand and put it on him. And he blessed him. And Jacob went out. Deceived him. Esau came right back in and found out what happened. He said, I will kill him. The rest of my life, I will kill my brother for what he did. So Jacob takes off, lives in a far land. <laughs> prospers 14 years, you know, kind of comes back to God in a sense. And he's kind of living half with God, half for himself. And then after 14 years or so, or 15, 
After 20 years, Esau is coming to get him. He finds out Esau and 450 of his soldiers are coming to get him. So Jacob goes, I'm dead. I'm a dead man. So he took all his family. You go that way. Okay, part of you go that way. You guys go this way. That way you can't kill both sides. Go. I mean, he was panicking. Then that night, the Lord God appears to Jacob and wrestles with him. Because we know it was God because he said, I've seen the face of God and lived. God wrestled with him. And after he wrestled with him, he said, Jacob, you're no longer Jacob, but your name is Israel. Israel means struggles with God, governed by God. Is that not the most brilliant name God has given believers? Israel struggled with God, yet submits to God. Yeah. That's powerful. So God says, no longer your name will be Jacob, but Israel. Because you're a changed man, Israel. And then Esau came in, forgave him. Everything was great. He was blessed, and then later, he would have a son. A second son to Joseph through Rachel. And he said, no, his name will not be Benoni. It'll be Benjamin. Benjamin means son of my strength, my honor, my favored one. My son of my right hand. He's not going to be son of sorrow. God will turn this around. He loved Rachel. This was hard. But he said, no, I'm going to have God take this son and make him a blessing. Benjamin became only second to Joseph in love. It says that later in Genesis, it says that the, the brothers of, of the brothers that told Joseph that Benjamin, our father's life is bound in the lad's life. You know, he loves him so much. So Jacob said, no. This is going to turn around. He was born in sorrow, but he will be son of my favor, my right hand, my strength. So what do you like now, Benoni or Benjamin? What do you like now? You know, the Bible is so amazing. You can know it all your life and still learn. So what's the point today? In our sorrows, if we turn to God, he will strengthen us. He'll make it better. Jacob believed sorrow could not defeat his life. And he believed this boy would be the most special only second to jo Joseph, who remember for a time, he, Jacob thought Joseph was dead, but he wasn't. And he was reunited with Joseph, as you read Genesis. You see, even suffering, God changes and redeems it. And that's why we come to this table. Do you realize Jesus said, the, the, the scripture says about Jesus, but for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, because he knew he would gain us. Do you realize that the Lord God didn't have to suffer, but he chose to suffer for us? And suffering, God redeems. Look at the redemptive suffering at this table. That's what we celebrate. That's what we thank him for right now. That through suffering, through sorrow, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, we almost want to hide our face, or what is this? He can't be of God. It's like he's being cursed. Well, yeah, he was being cursed for our sins. And how strong he became through suffering. Let's bow together. Heavenly Father, the word of God is amazing. I've gained so much by understanding the interplay between Benoni and Benjamin. Thank you, Lord, that even though sorrow happens in our life, you make it strength. And Lord, the most amazing thing about Benjamin, is it's, fun, it's literally from Benoni, the son of my misfortune, to Benjamin, the son of my favor.
Lord, you redeemed, you redeemed us through suffering. And you said you must suffer before glory. Now you're glorified forever. And you're redeeming this situation with us that's so grievous. We fell so far away, and yet you brought us so close through the cross. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.